is our pal Dan Shaughnessy. Uh, he's a Ford Frick winner, and this is a uh, is a Hall of Famer journalism. He deserves to be there. Boston Globe. Dan Shaughnessy joining us for the Boston Globe. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan underscore Shaughnessy. Check out the Globe online as well. Today we confer an honorary degree on Dan Shaughnessy, an award-winning journalist and author. Hi, my name is Dan Shaughnessy, and I'm a sports columnist for the Boston Globe and Boston.com, covering the Celtics, Bruins, Red Sox, Patriots, and everything else that goes on all around our town in sports. Dan is a prolific writer and the author of 12 books. He has been named the Massachusetts Sports Writer of the Year 12 times and named one of the top 10 sports columnists in America by the Associated Press Sports Editors 11 times. New generations of Red Sox fans have grown up with him. Raised near Boston in the town of Groton, Shaughnessy followed his beloved Red Sox throughout his childhood and on to college of the Holy Cross, where he put aside the ideas of playing baseball in exchange for covering the game. I'm a big fan of history and, you know, when these events happen, what is its place in Boston sports history? And I think the Globe has a place for that kind of institutional memory to bring that forward. By 1986, Shaughnessy was covering the Red Sox and as the national baseball writer. Most recently, Dan received the J.G. Taylor Spink Award for meritorious contributions to baseball writing presented annually at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. The writers, Ted Williams called us the Knights of the Keyboard. Peter Gammons calls us the eyes and ears of the fans. By any name, baseball writers have the best jobs in the world. We get to make a living following our favorite sport, delivering accounts and analysis of the daily soap opera. For New Englanders, Dan Shaughnessy has always been synonymous with Boston baseball. Well, it's flattering to hear people grow up reading Dan Shaughnessy. I mean, I grew up reading Ray Fitzgerald, and uh, I grew up reading Cliff Keen, and I got to meet those guys and work with them. So. I don't take it as any kind of offense. Uh, if people grew up with you, reading you, and they associate you with the region or the paper, that's, that's a good thing. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> So you just heard Dan Shaughnessy say he has one of the best jobs in the world. And I picked that up because I know that many of you studying sports communication, journalism, sports management, aspire to have a similar job. So I just want to tell you that um, if we're talking about in pursuit of truth, there's a truth here. And the truth is that Dan Shaughnessy deserves every bit of success and accomplishment that he's had in his career. And I know because I've known Dan since I was your age. Um, Dan and I were friends from the time we were 18. We went to different colleges, but we had mutual friends. In fact, he introduced me to one of his mutual friends, who's my husband, Bill Franklin. So for that, I'm really grateful. But I have a very distinct memory of it being about a year before college graduation. And Dan, I don't know if you remember, but we were with a bunch of friends from Emanuel at a club down near Fenway Park. And I said to you, what do you want to do when you graduate from college? And you didn't miss a beat. You said, oh, I want to be a baseball writer for the Boston Globe. And I was like, whoa, because we were still thinking we're going to be in college for the rest of our life. But he knew exactly what he wanted to do. There's more truth there. The fact is he worked really hard to make that happen. Dan was a writer for his high school newspaper, his college newspaper. When he was in college, he used to call the sports scores for Holy Cross into the Boston Globe. And I think they paid him $5 when he did that. And then he'd tap his wallet and say, I have enough money for the weekend. <laughs> he had to leave Boston to start his career, which is what I tell a lot of students. It doesn't always start in Boston, but if you're really good, you can come back. So Dan went away to Baltimore. Washington, D.C., a newspaper folded while he was writing sports for them, and then he somehow managed to bring himself back to Boston. So that's the truth about Dan Shaughnessy. The other truth that matters so much to me about Dan is that he's never forgotten his roots. He never forgets that he's a Boston-based person. Uh, when old friends ask him 
for favors, like coming to LaSalle to speak on Calm Day. He's just wonderfully responsive to that, and I'm really grateful to be an old friend of Dan Shaughnessy's and to be able to introduce the best sports writer in America, Dan Shaughnessy. coming out here today. Um, I always check uh, in pursuit of truth. Uh, am I related to anybody out here? Is there anyone in the audience? No. I have like 55 first cousins, so I check. <laughs> <laughs> it happens an amazing amount of times. I'll be down in Plymouth or Hanover or whatever, and someone will say, yeah, I'm your cousin's child, whatever. Okay, good. Uh, covered that. Um, so I, another question, there's going to be a few questions from me before we get to your questions for me. Um, Anybody here born in 2002? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. So everyone was born before 2002. Okay. <laughs> Anyone born in 2001? Anyone born in 2000? Okay, now we're starting to get it. Okay. So these people, so it's amazing to me to, to be in a world where you were all born before all this started, all these championships. And in this century, we had a little bit of a drought before 2002. Um, there were several droughts. I mean, the Red Sox went from 1918 to 2004. That was an 86-year drought. The Patriots had never won. So when they won in 2002, that was the one and only and the first. The Bruins one in 1972, and then we didn't see anything until 2011. The Celtics won a lot when I was a kid, but they had a drought starting 1986 until 2008. But, so those of you born in 2000 and before that, you have lived to see this amazing surge in the 21st century. This is the high renaissance of Boston sports. We're living it now. I expect most of you are around here. And I have been witness to all of this, having been at the Globe. I mean, they used my high school video there where I'm talking to the crowd there. I appreciate that. And uh, I've lived through all of this, all these championships, because I started at the Globe full-time in 81. My first story for the Globe was 1973, when we had covered wagons and typewriters. And uh, there, was, there was a drought. And in 2002, everything kicked in, and we are still living it now. And the championships in this century, starting in 2002, were won in New Orleans, Houston, St. Louis, Jacksonville, Colorado, Boston, Vancouver, Boston again, Glendale, Arizona, Houston again, Los Angeles, and most recently, Atlanta. I was at all of them. I wrote the front page story of the Globe for all 12 of those. And in my office, I used to have an office at the old Globe, which we sold. Now we got a place downtown, there's no space. So I had to take all my frames of these front pages and bring them back to my house. When the Red Sox won the World Series in LA in October, I went to the frame store and I, I bought three frames. I said, I gotta be ready. Patriots might win this year. For the Celt we, we were thinking then the Celtics might win this year too. That's not looking quite as good now, but the Bruins are good. So I've got extra frames to go with the 12 that are up there. This is the best place to do what I do. You saw in that video, we have these teams and you know, if there's people here who are not sports fans, it's okay. I am married to the all-time non-sports fan. My wife knows nothing about sports, and uh, it's okay. It's, it's, it's magical, but it's hard to live in this region and not have some knowledge of what's going on. It's just, how many here, we got a lot of young people and students and whatnot. Did anybody stay up for the 1880 World Series game? Whoa, that's pretty good. Okay, it was 3.30 in the morning that thing ended. And, uh, my daughter DVR, she has young babies, and she went to bed at midnight. She gave up and she just put two hours on the DVR. So when she woke up, it still wasn't enough. You know, because it went till 3.30. And in LA, those those jerks made a big deal when it got to midnight. They were all excited. Hey, it's past midnight, we're still going here. I'm like, it's three in the morning back in Boston. You guys got nothing. And uh, it is again such a special time to be living. One of the things when we talk about in, in pursuit of truth, uh, giving talks like this. Um, I do it quite a bit, and uh, I've known, I had one, it was a big corporate thing at a breakfast in downtown Boston. 
Breakfasts are bad because everybody's sleepy and they're all hung over from the night before. I know you guys aren't because it's later and there's no drinking in college. So, <laughs> but this crowd, you could tell it was a convention or something. And they, they wanted me to talk to the sponsors ahead of time, like, what are you going to talk about? We, we need to know. I'm like, that's Boston sports. There's tons to talk about. Don't worry about it. And no, no, we want to have a formal conference call. What are you going to talk about? So we're in this conference call. And, and this, this big shot guy says to me, I'd really like you to talk for an hour on the inner workings of the Patriot organization. I'm like, no one knows that. <laughs> and if I knew that, I wouldn't be telling you boring people at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'd be writing a book and making a lot of dough to tell that story. It's a nice story. No one knows that. You're not getting that truth out of me for whatever you pay me to come to breakfast at the Sheridan downtown at 8 in the morning. So that was that. And this is another little message. So you saw uh, that commencement. It was Southern New Hampshire, which is a really happening place. I was really impressed at Southern New Hampshire last spring. Gave the commencement address there. A few years back, this is kind of a weird one now, I got a call, uh, it was like in, I don't know, late April, uh, from Nichols College, asking me if I could be the commencement speaker, like three weeks hence. And I'm like, that's really flattering. I, I could do that, thank you. And I'm like, but I gotta ask, who bailed on you? Because, you know, we're three weeks out here. I have a feeling I'm not first choice. They said, well, as a matter of fact, uh, Bob Kraft bailed on us. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a lot funnier now than it was then. But, but still, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of the message there is you don't have to be first choice. That that was you know. So when I when I got to Nichols College to get this big speech, you know, it's graduation day, and you know, geez, you got the parents and everybody's all dolled up, and and um, I'm you know I'm introducing like you know dear faculty and board of trustees and parents and students and. I stand before you today because Bob Kraft bailed on you. And uh, I don't think the trustees were wild about that particular intro, but it, it had to happen. Um, and uh, so how did I get here? Just quickly, um, I Marie referenced some of it. I grew up in central Massachusetts, a little town called Broughton. had 4,000 people. One of them was Peter Gammons, who became a very famous sports uh, baseball writer. And uh, I went to the public schools for the whole 13 years. I went to Holy Cross. We had good teams then. We played Syracuse and BC and Army, and we were Division One. And I was the correspondent for the Globe. I was very immersed in, in writing about sports. I played through high school. Uh, <coughs> see, I wasn't going to be a professional player. I wanted to stay in it. I was always kind of a sponge guy, reading and writing about it. And uh, we had great role models in the local papers at that time. I would read these guys and try to be like them, emulate them. It's still a good lesson to read the people that you like. And, and, take something from everybody that you read. So, you know, I'm like just a little kid growing up in my little town, playing Little League Baseball. This is how times have changed. When I was playing Little League Baseball, I was traded. They traded my ass in Little League. <laughs> I mean, that would never happen today. I mean, now there'd be like lawsuits, you'd be on CNN, and would be like, you know, all this stuff. The parents would go crazy. But no, back then it was like, that. We, yeah, we had to even out the teams. You would trade it to the Braves. So I'm like, okay. I got two hats that way. I thought it was good. So, and then when I was in high school, I was on the varsity baseball and basketball teams, and they needed someone to cover the, the local paper, like the Newton Tab, or whatever your, your hometown paper is. And it comes out once a week. And I said, I'll do that. So I wrote, and I had a pseudonym you know, that I wrote under because I was on the teams. And it was, I had to rip myself in one of the stories. I missed two free throws against Littleton at the end of the game. I guess Shaughnessy got up there and choked at the end of the game, and I couldn't make his free throws. And, uh, but it wasn't my name on the byline, so I thought it was fair. And uh, you do have you know, things where you know, not everyone's going to be encouraging. When I was at Holy Cross, I wrote the alumni. I wrote for everybody. Anybody, the alumni publication paid, so I wrote for them for sure. The guy who was the editor hated me because I was sort of a wise guy. And I wasn't really a, I don't know, I was too much of a wise ass for the alumni publication because they only want good things in the alumni publication. And um, so we were always push, pull, and tug of war. And when I graduated, this guy, he was a Princeton snob. And he said to me, I can't understand why someone who can't write would want to go into journalism. He said, that's like someone who, who stutters wants to be in broadcasting. I said, well, thank you very much, Mr. Sprout. I'll remember that advice when I, when I go on. And I don't know what ever happened to that guy, but you can't listen to that. If you believe in yourself, stay with it. That's the pursuit of truth. Um, first job out of college when I knew Marie. Um, I could tell stories about you now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell about, about driving for the errand there. You know, no, I'm not gonna do that. So, um, but, uh, you know, 
my apartment was $81 a month in Brighton, and three law students, one of them's in the room here. I was the only one having fun. Those poor law students, first year, those guys were just, oh, it's awful. I, I was, I'd come home, you know, trying not to be happy and drunk and everything, and they were just studying, you know, it was awful. But um, we all went about it differently. But I remember, I finally, after two years of covering high schools for the Globe, they said, no more part-time, you gotta get out of here. And I, I applied everywhere I could think of in America where I had some sort of a connection or some contact, and the, the older writers were good to me to give me references. And one place I never heard from was the Milwaukee Sentinel. And later on, I realized I spelled Milwaukee incorrectly on all the application forms. I thought it was W-A-L-K-E-E, -E, you know, in Milwaukee. It's M-A-U-K, it's an Indian derivative. So surprise, surprise, I didn't hear from the Milwaukee Sentinel after I applied to them and misspelled the name of their city in the application. So do your homework. That's another lesson in the pursuit of truth. Um, I finally landed a job in Baltimore. I go down there and they let me cover the Orioles. I was 23 years old. And in those days, we really knew the teams. We traveled with the teams. Buses, hotels, airplanes. Um, it was living the life. It was like being a player, except we didn't get that kind of money or fame. We were just the schleb writers. But man, we really knew the players. And I got to do that with the Baltimore Orioles and later the Boston Celtics and the Boston Red Sox, where, I mean, I, I, I saw more Larry Bird for two years than my newborn daughter, because I was traveling with the Celtics, and that was the life that we led. We really knew them. And uh, in those years, again, you guys are young, young people, but like these, these statues that you see around town, Bobby Orr, I know Bobby Orr, he's a statue. I'm like, Bobby, what's it like when you meet someone at the Bruins game? You just say, meet me in my statue? That would be outside? Is that what you do when you have tickets? Red Auerbach down at Faneuil Hall. I wrote a book on Red Auerbach. He's got the cigar going down at Faneuil Hall. And uh, I got to know him. Ted Williams, the Ted Williams Tunnel. You drive through it going to Logan. I knew Ted Williams. And um, he was like a god. We were all afraid of him. But there's a tunnel for Ted Williams, not only because he got 406 batting average and two triple crowns and MVP twice, but he was a pioneer of children's cancer research, and he served his country in two wars. He lost five seasons to Major League Baseball, serving in two wars. 38 missions in the Korean War, landed his plane in flames. He ejected because he knew his career would be over if, he, uh, if, he, if it ended, and uh, a lot would have been over if it ended. But Ted Williams was a hero and a pioneer of children's cancer research and a great ball player. That's why there's a tunnel in his name. So I got to hang around these guys, know these guys. Pedro Martinez, saw him at the height. I mean, again, some of the older people may, maybe saw him pitch, but he's a great personality and a, 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 just a smart guy. Loved him. So it was, it was a great experience learning, knowing these people, living with them, writing about them. We could really bring them forward. That sort of got me into the book writing business because we really have a lot of reservoir of information to draw on. And uh, I've done 12 books in the course of, of time, just sports books, which aren't the same as real, real hard books, I suppose. Um, but an example of, of when you travel with teams, like here's how things went in the old days versus now. Like the old days, there was no cell phones. It was, we were typing the newspaper, people holding the old newspaper. So if you were traveling, no one knew what you were writing because they couldn't get it on the web. The wife would say, hey, John C. ripped you back in the paper today. That's how they'd find out. They had a pitcher named Bob Stanley. He was a... <laughs> Whoa! That's Bob Stanley. <laughs> See? Steve was coming for me. I'm actually kind of used to that because I, I never want anybody behind me. And uh, that's why, because they're, they're coming for you. Um, so this pitcher, you know, he was, he was overpaid, he was a little bit out of shape, and he wasn't doing very well. And in the middle of this, he starts saying bad stuff about the manager, Joe Morgan, who we loved. So I, I wrote a column very critical of Mr. Bob Stanley. And we're in Texas. And his wife sees, or he sees me in the clubhouse. He says, uh, yeah, my wife says you called me an ape in the newspaper. I said, Bob, I, I roughed you up in the paper. I thought you were out of, hand, out of line. I did not call you an ape. So I went and looked at the copy that I sent, you know, back, back to Boston. And I see in the fourth paragraph, I call him a buffoon. So what happens is his wife reads that, thinks it's Babylon or something, which honestly called it Babylon, called it April, and it's just like a whispering in a circle. And the pitcher in the clubhouse in Texas has no idea what I really wrote. He said, look, I said, I brought it down, I showed him the hard copy. This is what I wrote, fourth paragraph, I call you a buffoon. 
No way, but food. He goes, oh, okay. <laughs> as long as you put it that way. Now, fast forward to today's world, uh, the Red Sox had a player named Pablo Sandoval. You know, the panda. And I love the panda. You know, he's from Venezuela, quiet kid, made a barrel of money, had done very well with the Giants before he came here. Came here, he was a bust. You know, he, he had a weight issue, wasn't probably working out as hard, and he just, eating disorder, I don't know. But he, he, was, he was harmless enough. And, I wasn't the one paying him all the money, but he was totally underachieved. It was bad. So he was kind of, at, at spring training one morning, they had kind of, they were trying to hide him in the fat farm or something. And, and uh, I saw him come around, and he had a back issue, supposedly. And like, it was Easter Sunday morning. I said, Penny, what's up? It was 8 in the morning. I said, how's the back? He said, fine. Please go away. Happy Easter. We're like, happy Easter to you too, Ben. And uh, so I go and I tweet this. This is what you do now. You have to tweet everything. So I tweet the life of a beat writer, you know, 2015, Easter Sunday morning, 8 a.m., Sox Clubhouse. Me, Panda, how's the back? Panda, fine, go away, happy Easter. Me, happy Easter back. I go out, I go to work. An hour later, the PR guy of the Red Sox is running me down the backfield. He says, hey, Dan, Pablo's upset. He says he didn't tell you to go away. He said, by the way, happy Easter. I'm like, geez. So uh, I had it on tape, and he's a very soft-spoken guy. He's Spanish-speaking. And I listened, and sure enough, he didn't say go away. <laughs> he said, by the way. But I'm so used to people telling me to go screw, I just <laughs> assumed that that's what he was doing. You know? So you know, with a tweet, you can take it down, but it's still there, and screen saves and all that. And I, and I, I sent another tweet that I did him wrong and apologized the whole thing. I went back to the clubhouse later. I said, you're right. I'm sorry, that was my bad. You know, I said, I'm so used to people telling me to, you know, leap off that I just thought that's what you were doing and that, that's my bad. So anyway, we, we made nice and he didn't hold it against me. But, but that's how things in the old days versus now, like how stuff is, goes around in pursuit of truth. That's how it goes. The, um, we get to know them less than we used to know them. We don't have that access. We don't travel with them. We don't live with them. Today's writers or media people, they can't tell you what Kyrie Irving's like as much as I can tell you what Larry Bird's like. It's just not, there's a big moat there now that, that separates them from us. And it's, it's nobody's fault. It's evolution. Um, and to the point of, of the attack from behind that I was subjected to here uh, in the cell just now, um, <laughs> referencing how I'm used to that, it was, it's like with, with players being angry and fans being angry, we were in, um, in New Orleans for the Super Bowl. This is way back. But everybody who was mad at the Globe that week, they're always mad at the Globe for whatever, and I understand. And um, it was the night before the Super Bowl. <laughs> And I'm walking with like five other writers through the French Quarter. It's Mardi Gras. It's Super Bowl. It's the beads. It's the naked women. It's the drunks. It's the Patriot fans. It's all one big, you know, smorgasbord of all this. And walking to dinner on Saturday night before the Super Bowl in the French Quarter is a it's a trip. So we're walking and there's a clown coming toward us. Doesn't really stand out that much. The guy's in a full clown outfit and it kind of blends with everything else that sits around. And as the clown passes, he goes, Shaughnessy, you suck. <laughs> I'm like, what, what is the proper response to this? I'm like, yeah, well, uh, you're a clown. <laughs> That's what I said. I got him. And uh, it happens like the when Kraft was going to move the Patriots to Hartford. This was like 25 years ago. He really wasn't. But I knew. I said, he's. I said Hartford's America's file captain. He doesn't want to go to Hartford. And everybody in Hartford got mad. And the mayor of Hartford called me a chia pet. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. But <laughs> Pedro Martinez, this is another pursuit of truth then versus now. Pedro Martinez, he, he was, I, I just love him. And he was the greatest pitcher. I, I didn't see Koufax live, but in, our, in my lifetime, he was the good. So we had had Roger Clemens, who was really good here, really good. And we used to do these comparisons, Clemens and Pedro. You know, Rogers from Texas, Pedro's from the DR. Who's better, strikeouts, walks, winning percentage, ERA. And I would conclude and say, you know, Pedro even speaks better English than Roger Clemens. And he's from the DR. I and mean, that's pretty good. And he did. He was smart and he got it. And uh, there was one time he had a temper tantrum. And then after the game, he was all calm. And I wrote in my story, 
back when people used to buy the globe and read the globe and hardcover. And I said, it looked like he had, it was as if he had been uh, tased by a tranquilizer darkness, tiny butt, and then was all calm later. And he took this the wrong way. And uh, in his world, somehow he thought I was calling him gay. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and he really was bothered by this. And he pulled me aside, he called me Sean, he goes, Sean, I'm not gay. I'm like, what, what, no one said, he says, no, you're right about my tiny butt. I'm like, no, it's a tranquilizer darn thing. It's farm animals. I'm sure if you saw this in Spanish, it wouldn't. He goes, no, I've seen it's worse. I'm like, okay, I won't, I won't write about your ass anymore, Pedro. That's it, we'll ignore that. And then when he wrote his book, he wrote about this episode. He's still mad about it. So when he came back um, after the Red Sox, in 04, they win the World Series. Pedro's up, he's free agent, goes with the Mets, comes back to Boston, triumphant return. Pedro Martinez, New York Mets. And uh, first press conference, just like this. And he looks, he's so, he looks for everybody. He noticed one of his favorite radio guys wasn't there. He goes, where's Johnny Miller? And uh, we said, Johnny's got some back surgery, he's not here. And Pedro points right at me, he goes, how come he never gets sick? <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Pedro, I love you too, man. So, uh, in any event, um, the last thing I'm gonna say before we turn it over to you and take your questions is, um, in pursuit of truth, if you wanna get into this business, I beg you, to read and write and get out of your goddamn house or dorm and report. Don't watch TV and tell me what you think from watching TV. I don't care what you think from watching TV. I only care what you think when you have substance of things to tell me. Tell me what's going on at LaSalle. Tell me what's going on at North Andover. Tell me what's going on around you. Get out of the room and we'll go report it and tell me that. Don't watch things and give opinions on them. You're 20 years old, your opinion just doesn't mean that much right now, no hard feelings. So I get too many resumes and people writing about the Celtics and I don't care what they think about the Celtics. It's, that's not what we're here for. We're here to report and re report the truth and that's what we're doing. So anyway, that's the, that's the old guy off my lawn, Clint Eastwood thing you know, that I had to do. But uh, all that given now, was, what, what do you guys want to talk about? Take a few questions. So actually, that's a great segue for me to let you know. We're looking for sports writers and a sport editor for the 1851 Chronicle. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't know that. Yeah. Um, Maybe Dan can help. <laughs> oh, sure. And actually, we, we start with one question. Um, you wrote in the Globe a few years ago that surprise of all surprises, you're not a fan. And I actually give that story to my advanced journalism students. He says, I don't care who wins or loses. It's the sport and the game that I'm interested in. So really, you're not a fan? All right, so I am a fan of the sports. I am a baseball fan, basketball fan, all that stuff. Love watching the playoffs, all that stuff. So I'm a fan. I am not attached to who wins and loses. There are times it's the story for me. And I need to be able to tell that story regardless of who wins or loses. And we've had some epic wins and epic losses. I mean, the 28-3 the, the Super Bowl when they're behind Atlanta is a classic case where they're going to lose that game. And we need to get started writing the story. And Atlanta says, get going on that story. I'm like, no, I've seen these guys too many times. I'm not giving up. They might win this game. And that way, I watched the whole comeback instead of writing about them losing, which would have been the reverse. But we've had it work both ways. So I'm a fan of the sports. I'm a fan of this region. But I, I am not tied into them winning and losing. I, I, that's like betting on the games. I'm not emotional that way about it. So who else has a question? Way back. At what point in your career did you lose the fandom? At what point um, did I lose the fan part of the career? Again, it's, I felt, uh, does it matter? Yeah, just so we can <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> You're like Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, that's a good question. I think that when I was 23 and covering the Orioles and little with them, I probably was a little more kind of rooting for them. Um, I was so close in age, and I knew them so well, and everybody was nice to me. They had a kid from Manchester, New Hampshire, on the team. The guy from Pittsfield, the team, that was good for me, they were nice. I know when I came back to Boston, I really, I probably worked too hard at it. Is this, what's that, what's that? Um, but, 
get rid of the Freddie Mercury part. No, I'm still doing that. Anyway, uh, so I would say when I came back to Boston, I was pretty, I was pretty intent on being a real reporter about it and just not. And it, that, that's not everybody. It's changed a lot. Uh, I think that we see more fans writing for fans now and fan sites. And to me, that's what talk radio is for, and that's what uh, team websites are for, and you know, blog sites, fanboy sites, that sort of thing. If it's still the Boston Globe, in my view, we're supposed to be reporting. I mean, and I know that everything, this is one of the, this is another long, windy thing I won't get into, but that's part of the problem is like with Fox News does one side and MSNBC does the other side, there's no middle, you know, we're supposed to be the middle. And I think in sports, it's fun, it's easy to be the middle. We're sort of like movie reviewers, you know, it's like when you go to the movie, you can tell whether it was a good or crappy movie. It's okay to tell people that. It's been mostly good around here lately. It's pretty hard to be critical or negative because they're just so good. So, I mean, I'm going back to Florida today, and I, I can't even think of what to write about the Red Sox. Because, you know, it's 22 of the same 25 guys in that team. They won the World Series. So, you know, we'll try to make it interesting, but, uh, you know, it's almost like too good and too easy right now. But um, anyway, I would say probably when I was about 30 years old, I think that the real root for the team went out of me. Next question. That's it? You guys make fun of it. There we go. <coughs> Uh, we're about the same age. I never remember any kind of run like this, either in Boston or any other city. I think we're in a um, uh, situation where we will never see this again, where in one, you know, eight, 19 year period, there were 13 or 14 titles. Uh, do you see that happening in no. any other city? No, I mean, again, we had, uh we had all four teams win a championship in a period of six years and four months. That will, no, one, no other city will do that. It's just impossible. Um, this is it. I mean, we've had good ownership, we've had good fortune, and star players. It's all come together at the perfect time. And you know, the Bruins could win this year. Southers could win this year. It's, it's, there's no end in sight. Yes? That's you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I don't have a microphone. So you mentioned that um, for college kids to get out, get out of their bubble, and as a professor, I'm constantly trying to reiterate that, get off campus. But what are qualities you think that make someone stand out? Is it grit? Is it the ability, obviously, to write as journalists, as sports com, you know, majors, if they want to get into production, the writing? I mean, what, what should they have that someone else doesn't? I mean, I think that, uh being on time is critical, you know, um, uh, punctuality, without a time stand still, got to have that. So that's a stupid joke from movie. But in any event, um, yeah, uh, being on time there, uh, you know, not being arrogant about it, not expecting things to be done for you. If you're going to interview somebody, do your homework, you know, bone up on all that. Don't be asking them where they were born or where they're from, you know. And, you know, I, I get too many kids, you know, stuff that's readily available that should be done ahead of time. Don't waste the subject's time with that. Um, and uh, I think enthusiasm is, you can, be, you can be a little bit pushy and not be overly pushy, but you want to be aggressive. Um, there's a line there, most people know where it is. Uh, respectful of old people, we all love that. Um, and I think uh, reading and writing, just enthusiasm for the subject matter. If you're enthusiastic, you love the subject matter, it'll come out. Everybody in this room has got the mechanics to read and write at, at the next level, because they, they wouldn't be here if they weren't. Uh, but just kind of honing those skills and, and the interest that you have, you know, as best I can do. Um, yes, young man. Um, after writing for, uh, for print for the print portion of the start of your career, um, and as digital platforms like Twitter and Facebook came along later, um, what type of challenges did you face personally with having to tailor your content to fit those? Um, social networks better. Like Twitter only has right. 140, 280 sure. characters. Um, how is that different for you than writing for a print? I probably push back on. I mean, I do tweet, you know, reluctantly at gunpoint. I, I send a few out here and there, but it's not my mode. I can't communicate anything substantive there, and my kids always tell me I'm doing it wrong and all that. So I mean, I get that. <laughs> I haven't. I probably haven't adjusted as well as I might. I'm fast, and that really helps. So if, you know. Uh, you know, somebody gets traded or dies or gets popped for PEDs, I can, I can have something web ready in an hour or less. That's, that's an asset these days. Uh, speed is, is good, 
you know, get used to speed when you have turn papers due. It's okay to just tear them off and go with your first thought and then you can polish them up. But don't sit there trying to wait for the perfect thing to come to you. You know, just gotta be fast. So speed helps. But my adaptability, what I what I this is the old guy thing again too. I, I miss the, the the craft of good writing is is slowly eroding. Uh, well crafted writing is not valued. Uh, humor is not valued or, or attempted. Um, and just the brevity of, of social media takes away a lot. The anonymity of social media emboldens cowards, and there's a lot of weird weird there that aren't great. Um, but there's a lot of parts of it that, that have made the business better. Uh, I'm, I'm just I'm still really old school, and I still value well crafted writing, but nobody even notices, and it, it just it just flies over their heads. Uh, people are they're too busy on yelling and screaming and, and just that, that that quick content thing. That's old guy stuff. Sorry, agree? Yeah. I'm not even sure all our students know this, but John Henry, the owner of the Red Sox, is also now the owner of the Boston Globe. And I'm just wondering, does he exert any influence over you and your work? It's a horrible situation, which again, he's, he's been a good owner and he has deep pockets and we need, it's like Jeff Bezos has been a great thing for Washington Post to have a billionaire owners in a time when news organizations are cutting back and not hiring and all that sort of thing. So it's good to have that sort of substance in ownership. But um, it's dreadful to have the owner of the Red Sox own the Boston Globe because it compromises all of our work. If we get a scoop, they'll say it was handed to you. And uh, there's the inference that, that we're trying to be nice to them and, and harder on the Patriots than we are on the Red Sox. We can't defend ourselves against that. The conflict of interest is there. Uh, it doesn't compromise my work. He hates me. He hasn't talked to me in nine years. So I can, I can validate my independence. And it's, it's in, you know, good on him for not firing someone that he hates. So I think that's a good illustration for him. But, uh, but at the same time, we're, still, we're always um, going to be charged with that. And there's no, there's no getting around it. It's the only situation in America where the team owns the news entity. It's the only one. There's entities where the it's the other way around. The news entity owns the team, but this is the opposite. Not good. Nothing good. Yes. You. Uh, it was mentioned that you didn't start your career in Boston. Sure. Uh, how are you able? I repeat it. How are you able to build your credibility to the point where you're able to come? Yeah, to this it's interesting. Uh, so the question was, I, I, I was raised here, and if that helps, and how if you're not from here, are you not from here? Not from Vermont. Vermont, well, that's from here. Something <laughs> <laughs> from like New York or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that I think it's a really valid thing because uh, with with opinion people, generally, a, a lot of us we don't trust opinion if it's not some from around here, and especially around here, we're very provincial and you know territorial and, and tribal and all that sort of thing. So if somebody comes from Chicago, we have a we have a columnist now, Tara Sullivan. She's great. She's from New York. And I know there's people like she's from New York. What does she know? You know, Bob Ryan's from Trent, New Jersey. He's only been here 60 years, but it's like he's an outsider. You know, so, so yeah, that's that's a tricky one, and it takes it takes a while to but develop that kind of trust. But if, if your work is good and your opinions are good and, and you're fair, I think people. But sometimes it takes time on that. But again, Vermont, you're local. You count. You're one of us. Who else has a question? Yes, and the Celtic Shamrock there. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to get your opinion on uh, Robert Kraft, and um, if you think it was just like a wrong place, wrong time thing, or if he's like the main villain to take him, and he just has this like underground network of like sex ring no one knows about. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the latter. It was a, obviously a very unfortunate thing for, for that team, for his reputation, for his family in this area, um, for his great philanthropic work, the legacy of his wife, who was a legitimate saint, one of the greatest humans ever to walk the earth. Um, but, you know, I think that, again, he who was without sin cast the first stone. That's always a tricky one. But as someone who covers that team, uh, they've had a disproportionate amount of scandal with, uh, you know, the Spygate thing, which they copped to, the Deflategate thing, which they were doing. It was a small thing, but they were doing it. And they were overpunished for it because they wouldn't cooperate, all that sort of stuff. It's not why they win games, but they've had issues with that. And now to have the owner in that situation, uh, it, 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 it speaks to a certain level of hypocrisy, and, uh, and again, it's very unfortunate for his family. To me, it makes you question judgment and fitness to be 
in charge. Uh, the notion that this individual was at an establishment like that, was pulled over by the police, and then went back the next day. I can't get my head around that. And then going to the Oscar parties. That looks like we're not taking this seriously. I think those things, I think those are unfortunate choices, uh, which is, is about as far as I, I'd be willing to go at this point. Because like I said, none of us have been there. I feel very bad for his family. Not good for the organization. He'll get spanked by the NFL. He'll get four games, half a million dollars, whatever. It does not matter. It's a misdemeanor. It's a small, legally, it's a small infraction. The reputation and, and the level of responsibility that he has and his relationship with, I mean, his best friend in the owner's box was Les Moonves for the last 20 years, you know. So start putting those dots together. It's not good. Mr. Franklin. Dan, you've had a very illustrious career in the Hall of Fame. You've got a lot of recognition. Have you had any disappointments or setbacks in your career? And if so, how, did, how have you overcome them? Well, disappointments. Go Google me. You want to read about disappointments? <laughs> like, you know, who's this monster? You know, so I mean, people get very emotional about their teams, and uh, there's a lot of pushback. It's just not fun. I'm not used to that. It comes with it. But I have everything I ever wanted professionally. I mean, I, I turned down chances to leave here. I love working here. We have these great teams. I'm so, it's so great to be able to write about the teams in this region. And it's really what keeps me going. I mean, the teams are all good. I could stop, and many want me to stop. But uh, why would you? They'll tell you when to stop, I figure. And maybe that's coming tonight. I don't know. But uh, it's, uh, it's just a great time to be doing it. And we have, such, we have so many great sports fans, smart fans. People pay attention to the teams, they keep you on their toes. And the fact that there's so many of them and there's so much passion in the region, the teams are so good, enables us to go on TV and radio and write books and just have all these opportunities. So no better place to do, I, I can't, uh, I have no regrets about any of it professionally. It's just, wow, what a ride, it's been great. Keep it going. Who are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I know that uh, you do some work with the Sports Hub, so uh, how did you get into radio, or, and how do you enjoy it? Because there is a lot more direct criticism with that. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, so, some of that's just what we were just talking about there, but, you know, if, you, if you're a columnist for the Boston Globe, if you're Chris Gasper, or Tara Sullivan, or Alex Beard, they, they want that content. You know, th those radio stations, they're on, you know, forever. These guys do five-hour shows at night by themselves with no calls. I don't know how they do it. You could probably do that, but I can't. And uh, so, you know, there's opportunity there because they need content and because people read us in the paper. And then it actually, it's helpful. In the old days of media, the Globe would say, you need to get permission before you go on the sports up. Now they want us to do that because it spreads the brand. More people reach on Twitter, more social media, more digital platforms. Spreading the brand is big. So the, the newspaper used to think of you as uh, intellectual property. Now it's like, get out there and uh, do everything. So we do. And this, for us, it's a way to, you know, it's a way to pay the tuition of the salad and, and star market, you know. I mean, that's why I do it, you know. Next guy. Uh, so you, you're obviously very well known for all the work you've done with the Red Sox. Who, do, who would you say is your favorite player to report on over the past 30 plus oh years? Oh my God, <laughs> so many great ones. I, yeah, um, well, Pablo Sandoval was a favorite, as you know, so that was a good one. Um, I, I love, I think Pedro, I think the last 30 years, are Larry Bird for me, Pedro probably, um, it's just, and this, this, this group they got now, I mean, it's going to be great watching, you know, Betts and Ben Attendee and all these young guys as they go for I love Devers. You know, he's always smiling. I think he's going to rake. Love him. Next guy. Hello. So I'm a senior journalism student, and my, big, uh, my biggest concern is um, developing that confidence in order to the point where um, any criticism you receive, you don't take it personally, or able to just kind of breeze through interviews um, talking to complete strangers. So how, as a reporter, how do you develop that confidence? Well, be prepared. It's just when you get to the subject, just know your stuff. You know, don't ask something that you should already know. Be prepared and try to listen to the answer. Don't be too focused on your next question. You know, because you might miss something, if, and he might say something that's really good, and you're so nervous and busy about your next question that you didn't hear what he said. Watch, watch TV interviews. You see that all the time. You know, the, the reporter is so nervous and so thinking about the next question. Did you hear the guy just told you he was gay and no one even knows? You know, it's like no, you got to listen to that. You know, and then respond to that. Yes, right here. Yeah, you. Let me get your finger. 
Um, I'm a Steelers fan, and I, with the Patriots recently getting six and the Steelers getting their first, I just want to get your opinion on which means more the Steelers getting their first or the Patriots getting their quicker. I have this argument with my friends all. Well, wait, wait. What do you mean getting their first? What do you mean? The Steelers got to six Super Bowl before the Patriots did. <laughs> wait. Wait. <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers? Yes. I'm a Steelers fan. But they have six. They have six rings. Yes, they got there before the Patriots. Oh, getting there before? Yes. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, again, that, the Steelers in the '70s, I mean, you can't match that. And the Steelers, you, you know, they're the last team to beat the Patriots. Because you know, this year they were the last team to beat them. I love that. I love going there. I love that trip every year. And uh, I want them to be good. What do you think about losing those two good players, though? You know, let me ask you. You know, how do you? Did you want? What do you want them to do? With those, you know. Um, yeah. They're dysfunctional. Yeah. Your Press the bottom. Your team is like the microphone. It's dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I think Antonio Brown and Love were incredible talents. And obviously, I'd rather keep them. But at some point, you have to look at the, the talent out of the distraction. And at this point, I'm just looking for trade value from them again. The most okay. that we can. That's very mature. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know you've been accused of being an overly negative sports yes. writer. Yes. Um, how do you respond to those claims, and has that made you become a better writer? Um, again, the, the overly negative thing, I see it as a sort of a byproduct of the, the changing times where there's more fans writing for fans, and everybody wants good things only, and no one wants anything to be challenged or questioned. So to me, if, if, I, if I wake up at, in the morning and it's 10 degrees outside, and I put my coat on, I'm not being negative. I'm just getting ready for what's coming, you know. So that's how I that's how I look at the teams. It's like I thought they were going to lose in the playoffs last year, the Red Sox. I thought it was a little bit of fool's gold, 108 wins, because there's so many crappy teams in the American League this year, and they had none of those pitchers had ever won a postseason game. The track records were abysmal. They had been swept by the Astros, been swept by the Indians in 16, and lost to the Astros in four and 17. I'm like, I'm not in. The Yanks are going to beat them. I thought they would lose to the Yankees. So if that's negative, that's me. I was just preparing for 10 degrees and I was putting my coat on. Well, I, I turned out I was wrong, and thank, and that's good. But yeah, I don't, It's you know what, it's sports. I mean, all those people wrong about the election, I think you pay the price more when you're wrong about something that really matters. Being wrong about sports, I can live with that. Wrong all the time. I mean, if anybody knew, they'd be gambling and winning all the money and all that stuff like that. So it's only sports, it doesn't bother me. I just, I like accountability. I'd rather you tell me on the way out the door, you suck, you know, like a clown, rather than, than go on your blog and say, yeah, this guy was here today and he really sucks, you know, like that. Just, just tell me, just just stand up and be a man about it. It's only sports. We don't need to be writing stuff on the bathroom wall. The an anonymity is, I hate that, very cowardly, no good. Uh, you asked one already. Did you ask one? No. Yeah, fire away. So, I was born in 99, so, all I've seen is success <laughs> yeah. uh, ever since I remember. So, in your personal opinion, when do you think all of this is going to end? Well, again, you know, you're in a big market with good ownership, with deep pockets. So it tends to the Red Sox thing is a little fragile right now because those four players the Bills come to do, how many can they keep? The pitchers, Sale and Priscilla are up this year. No one's noticed. Bogarts is up this year. So, and they don't. The farm system is not that good. That one's teetering a little bit, I think. They have deep pockets and they can buy players. Their farm system's not that good. Um, the Celtic thing, it feels like it's going to, this, who knows what's going to happen between now and July with Kyrie, and whether they're going to you know, go get Davis and keep Kyrie, and trade Tatum and Brown, or let Kyrie go because he wants to go. No chance of getting Davis and develop through Brown and Tatum. I, it's, I don't know which way that's going to go. I think it's one or the other. Hockey, I know nothing about. You get the hot goalie, you win the playoffs, I don't know that. how to do that. So, Patriot thing, I'm sorry, 42 year old quarterback with no backup. There's some term limits on that too, as far as I'm concerned. And, and they're supposed to be parity in that league, which is the amazing part of their dynasty that they've overcome the parity. Sorry, Steel fan. So we have time for one more uh, question. Say one more question. I see an arm up. Shannon Hart. Shannon. Yes, that's you. You got it. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when you go down to the spring training trail Yeah. How is that different from when you're covering a regular game up here? And what's that experience like seeing the new players that are coming in for the new season? Yeah, it's a nice question. So the spring training games, I mean, I don't get caught up at all in wins and losses. You're just looking for features. 
and you see a guy Chavez hitting four home runs in the first two weeks, that's a huge thrill. There's a point of discovery. I remember seeing Brian Dawback, you know, raking down there, never heard of this guy, and then he comes up and he hits 20 home runs four years in a row. So there is a nice innocent discovery to being down there. It's a nice time of year down there. Everybody's in a good mood, the players, the fans. There's a lot more interaction. It's relaxed. The weather's a lot better than this. I can't wait to get there and leave all you in a little few minutes here. But, um, uh, yeah, so it, there's a sweetness to the spring training part that really is nice, and it's nice of you to remind me of that as I, as I head back into it. You guys have been great. Study hard. I'll